Great, welcome everybody to the stress busting masterclass. It's a pleasure to talk to you about this topic. It's one of my most favorite topics, like what happens in the brain when we have stress, how, does, um, how do we handle stress, uh, stress, and even more interesting, how does stress handle us? <laughs> and what can we do against it? So I give here in Phuket Cleanse, just to give you an idea, three classes, or it's a, it's a, it's a package. So today we're focusing on stress, and then in the midweek we have a mindset in neuroscience basics and we have an advanced course some of you already had that which is a bit more practical how you can try to change your story um, I like to keep the classes interactive so if you have questions just interrupt me and we, we take it from there and I was also adding a little bit something new uh, in this class about habits and how to build habits, uh, just a very short slice because I got a lot of questions about that and I think it could be interesting. So stress, if I just can open the talk with a question to you guys, who have you experienced in the last months or weeks like stress in certain kind of form? Yes, raise your hand. So that's a pretty typical answer and actually it shows that when we look at statistics and we look at um, how stress is perceived that stress symptoms are like getting more and more common so in the last 70 years more and more people say yes they feel stressed um, there is another publication just to give you some, some dates that they did with english uh, young people uh, over 20 years and it shows that the perceived stress doubled in like how they perceive the life as stressful. More and more people experience stress and that it's a, a kind of a phenomenon that is also backed by, by science that when you ask people like how stressful their life is, they report that like in this study with the English ad, uh, young adults, uh, over 20 years stress symptoms doubled. Um, stress is also one of the main reasons why productivity decreases at the workplace. So people who are stressed are not as productive. It actually shows it's not useful if you work longer hours and more and are more stressed, but like work for a certain amount of time, but in a good concentration. And that's one of the topics that I personally very interested in. Stress negatively affects the immune system on many levels. Like it has multiple effects on how your immune system works and or better otherwise say how it doesn't work. Please come in. Very welcome, we still have more space. Just find a mat or something. So what's interesting when we say chronic stress and we're talking here about the stress that is like not good for us, when this is getting more and more present, um, I show you now some data which are actually contradicting uh, this theory. For example, in Germany in 2015, people worked 40% less compared to around 60 years ago. So it seems like 60 years ago, people were 70 years already, when we say 2020, 2020, people worked much more. Then another interesting data point is that people live longer all over the world. And longevity is somehow one of the best measurements how stressful a life is. Like if you have a lot of stress in any kind of, of, of sense or any kind of form, you have less probability to survive. Um, what's also interesting is that today there is more wealth, education, less war and starvation compared to 200 years ago. So we live probably in one of the best times ever on this plan planet as a human race. And this is not only a short term effect. If you look at the brain, the brain has like different centers that process different like functionalities of what we do of our behavior. We have one particular region which is called the amygdala, which is kind of a fear center that processes fear and stress and how we react to aversive events. So it shows that the size of this functionality spot is much bigger in rats compared to apes compared to humans. So our brain has a much smaller fear center compared to animals which have a much more stressful life, like a rat is always on alert. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, what's going on? Like everybody's stressed, but we live in one of the best times ever. So something is not fitting into the equation. Um, I have 
two different ideas or takes on that. The first thing is I don't think we are in a stress crisis. I think what we really are in is a, a resilience crisis. So somehow we did forget or unlearn how to cope with stressful events and situations. And that could have different uh, reasons. Um, I'm going gonna, gonna to list some or three which I consider as the one of the most important one. And that is, first of all, a loss of meaning. We have everything. So if you compare our lives to our grandfathers and grandmothers, they had not everything. They had to struggle, they had to fight. We have everything, at least like privileged people as, as we are and being able to be in this place today. It seems like we, we, we don't have this, this craving anymore for like surviving. And so when you have everything, so what's next? So you lose kind of a meaning. Then what we also observe is a loss of community. So people move around much more. They're not living the whole life in the same village. They're not connected to the same friends. And social networks, and I don't mean it in a, in a digital way, they are really, really important uh, to help you to cope with stress and stressful situations. Um, the people that live the longest, they don't live in New York. They live in a small island in Japan and they live the whole life in the same village. I don't think it's, uh, of course, there are many factors like food and, and other things, but I think it's not, um, uh, how you say, by, by accident, yes. And con like, again, to this point, close to this point and related is overconnectivity. I think we are all connected, but somehow disconnected. So we, we are all the time on our phones. We didn't have 1,000 friends in Facebook. We have like many messages. We, we, we have a lot of like input of emails and whatever. And I think that's really not healthy. The brain is not made for that. The brain is a very old structure that is not made for WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And so this is stressful in a sense. That is like we are all always on overload. So I think that's one take on it why we are so stressed. Um, another thing uh, which is not backed by science but my personal observation or my personal opinion is I think there is a, is a tendency of like culturally influenced that stress becomes trendy. And so I, I like to watch a lot of sports. Uh, I like soccer and rugby. And what I'm always amazed is that rugby is a sport that is much st more stressful than soccer. But the behavior of like how the, p the players behave and how they show emotions and not is like 180 degrees like different. Rugby is hard and nobody complains, never. It doesn't matter what happens. And in football, nothing has to happen and everybody has like to go to the <laughs> hospital. And I think it's interesting and, and it's not just, you can say, okay, it's, it's just uh, an example from sports, but there are also in history interesting aspects or, or take on that I'm gonna show you too, and that is, the, um, the phenomenon called hysteria and another phenomen phenomenon from the Second World War is the kamikaze pilot. This is the, was the first kamikaze pilot from Japan who like showed a certain kind of behavior and emotionality towards his nation and then it became a trend in the same way hysteric and hysteria was very very popular at the <coughs> beginning of the 19th century and it was treated as an illness and it was really like it was something. So I observe, or my take is that actually, I think stress becomes a trend. And I don't say that to disqualify that we are stressed. I really think we are stressed and we, we can work on that, but it's also a kind of approach, okay, like believing in ourselves and taking the responsibility that we actually can cope with the situation. And so in my talk now, I would like to, to show you first a little bit the theory and then we go into practice. It's, uh, it should be also with a practical class. So what happens if you are confronted with a stressful situation? Well, the brain evaluates certain kind of stimuli. So the brain sees something, it makes a concept. What you see here is the classic stress axis, stress response. So this is the central brain. And the brain perceives something as stressful and says, okay, this is not good. This is something I have to deal with it. And then a whole cascade of reactions are triggered from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland to the adrenal gland. And in the end, you release a lot of cortisol. So cortisol is known as one of the major stress hormones. And cortisol is not only bad, like 
we will see later cortisol is also good. It will increase your memory. Like when I give a talk, I will have a certain amount of cortisol because I have, I'm alert, I want to give a good talk, so that's not only bad. The problem is if you have over weeks a uh, level which is much, much too high. Now, um, it is interesting with stress is um, an event is not considered a stressful or let's say it like this, it's not the same stressful event if you know you're going to have it or not. So let me explain this with a little drawing. Like if you think this is your plan for your life. So you say, okay, I'm here. We have a lot of goal setting classes. We say, there I'm going to go and this is going to achieve. I make tiny little steps and a slow increase and then go there. Well, life unfortunately doesn't unfold like this. Life is more something like this. And now if you are at the beginning of your journey and you know this is the road I have to walk, it is less stressful than when it unfolds um, in an unknown way. Like the brain doesn't like unpredictability. So this, this timeline unfolds more like, like a diffuse, like fog, you know? You, you don't know what's behind the next curve. You don't know, and that's stressful. It's like, who of you did try a Thai massage? Mm -hmm. You know? For us Western, Thai massage is so at the edge of being nice and not nice and, and you never know like when comes the next elbow and <laughs> and so this is exactly the same it's it and, and for us i think probably thai people can relax much more than we do so we are always in this kind of <laughs> alert <laughs> moment so it actually shows also like when you when you research that that this is actually true that we perceive stress as more painful or events as more painful if we don't know they're coming so unpredictable events uh, are more distressing. They are generating more uh, ulcers, like kind of in the, in the intestines um, tissue, and they intensify anxiety. So why do I tell you that? Well, I, as you maybe know, I'm a neuroscientist, and I did my PhD in a wonderful city in Barcelona. So I, I, I want to show and share with you a little bit my story, then you will understand that there is a difference between knowledge and actually application. So that's why in the second part we're going to work practically because when I give talks, I, I never met somebody who doesn't know what to do. So in a way we all know what we should do, like how we could cope with it, but then the application is the problem. How can you translate it into action? So as I said, I did my PhD in, in Barcelona. This is actually a photo from the, the area where I lived, like behind this big building in, in some of the top floors, flats with a terrace with 180 degrees sea view. So you can imagine this is uh, not the worst place to do a PhD. <laughs> it's a wonderful city, um, good weather, nice people. You know yourself, yes. <laughs> you live yeah. there. So it's really, really livable. So if, if I would say I have to describe my life in Barcelona with one word, it would probably be very, very carefree. Like I had a, a pretty good time. Well, this changed very dramatically for me from literally one day to the next. When I was suddenly sent to the hospital um, because I had a lot of stomach pain and I didn't felt well and I had to make some analysis and it turned out that I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So, as a scientist, obviously, I was interested in what I have. So I asked my doctor if he can, like, write me the exact diagnosis. And I rem remember very well, he was, like, taking a little note, and he made, he wrote it on it, and he, he, he like, transferred it on the, on the table like this, and said, yes, this is what you have, but don't look it up. So, obviously, I went home <laughs> <laughs> and I went to Dr. Google and I always say um, Dr. Google is a very smart idea if you have a flu, it's not the smartest idea if you have pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's like a really, really stupid idea and it's probably, I mean, I, I went through some search results and in one random search result that was written that 95 
50% of people with my type of pancreatic cancer die in three years. And this was the moment where I realized that there is actually, I mean, first of all, you're floored, you don't know what to do, and the, 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 foot, uh, the, the floor under your feet just away. Um, but I also realized I just had a PhD in stress and emotions, and I had no clue how to deal with this situation. And this is interesting, it's like, you can go to many talks here and, and listen to a lot, but the, the transfer of the knowledge into action is a complete other story. And so, um, Faisal, you asked me today, how did I came into talking? So this is actually how I came into talking, like to transfer this like from my own experience, how can I give uh, like people an idea how what they can do with the theory. So one thing you can do, and I'm lucky I had a very good doctor. He, he told me a story of another patient uh, with a similar diagnosis to me, and he said, look, Martin, um, this young guy, we, we treated him well, and he is now skiing in the mountains. And so I had the 95% against me, but then I had this one story. And that's where I started to believe in the power of story, because I was just thinking, okay, if there is one person who is like, making it then maybe I can also make it and so when I was looking back and I saw this number which was really really scary to me suddenly I was able because of this story to shift my focus so I didn't saw the 95 percent anymore but suddenly I saw the five percent and that's another thing you can do when coping with stress like um, try to focus on something that lifts you up and not something that like is against you. Uh, it's very natural that the brain deviates to the, the bad news, but then even more try to, to keep on the good news. So what I did then, and that's what I'm, like always try to bring across in my talks is, um, you have to do something. And I did something. Um, it was in one of my first chemotherapy. I had since then many, many therapies, many surgeries. It's kind of a, a very intense story. But in one of the first therapies, um, there was somebody in the room who didn't have such a good day and, and also got the, the infusion. And he was annoying everybody and he just was telling everybody that he wanted just to die in peace. And for me, this was very shocking and, and very tricky to handle, but it also triggered something in me that I was asking myself, okay, what do I want? And it was very fast, very clear. I, I didn't want it to die in peace. So I literally took my mobile phone like this. So I had here the, the connection of the chemo. And while I was sitting there, I was signing myself up for a triathlon. I have to add that I never did something like that before. I played tennis and I was in a swim club when I was a teenager, but I, never, I was never a runner, I was never a biker. My brother did a triathlon a year before, so that was somehow my inspiration. And I was just thinking of the most crazy thing I could think. I, I needed that. It's not, I'm not saying, telling this story that I say everybody has to do that, but for me it was kind of bringing my mind away from the stressful thinking to the, to the good story. So when I did that decision, and that's when I talk in my talks always about you have to make a decision or you anyhow make a decision. Like even if you act on it or not, that's also a decision. For me, really something clicked. And so the next week, I decided that I had to start with my training. <laughs> And so this was, I was a week in for a combined radio chemotherapy in the hospital. And um, I remember very well when I was walking in with, uh, we say, we patients say the Christmas tree, like where you hang all the, <laughs> the stuff. And um, the guy who had to run this physio room, the assistant, he looked at me like kind of, what, you, what do you want here? Because he had patients with hip replacements and this kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, I just want to go on this trainer. And, I know this, this training was probably five minutes, and that, that was it. But for me, it was such a symbolic training. And, and I, when I did the photo, I was never, like, I would never have thought that this photo became so important to me, but it was so symbolic. And so it's really not about, okay, I have to go out in 5K. It's like, okay, I knew this is one step, and the next day I do a little bit more. Um, 
Another funny anecdote from, from my swimming, when I finished chemo, I went swimming because it's also involved swimming. And I remember I, I was in the swimming pool. I tried to, to swim and then the old ladies were taking me over. <laughs> I was like, okay, uh, maybe I have to still improve something here. <laughs> but it was funny, it was not demotivating me in some kind of way. So around three months, four months after I finished my, my keynote, I, I was able to run more and get more into shape. And then I also finally managed to get my first triathlon done in Zurich. That was really, really nice. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I add here a photo to the finish line when I cross because I think this photo is even as important to me as the other one. This is on my left side is my older, smaller brother. <laughs> and on the, on the right side is Giorgio, a good friend of mine from Barcelona. So they did with me this race together. And during my last six years, I, I learned a lot about community and about this support and network. And, and it's really true. Like if, if you are able to build a network that supports you, it's really, really helpful. So what then happened is um, I was writing a blog about my story and this story was getting picked up from other patients. A friend of my mom, she, she was printing out the blog and taking it to the hospital. And that was the moment where something clicked. I was like, okay, I had this gear and it changed my story and now my story becomes somebody's story. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a project about it. So I presented this idea of, of sharing stories from struggle online and documenting them and then presented it on a, on a big stage and I fundraised some money and I quit my job together with my wife and we traveled once around the world, just like going one way ticket, one way ticket, always in one direction, just looking for more and more stories. And it's interesting, you can look at it online, it's called mysurvivalstory.org, I can share it in the WhatsApp group if you want. And at this point it's only about cancer, but what the people talking about, it's, it's universal. It's really, the cancer is just uh, accelerated that you confronted with the real like um, questions of life much faster. So. I would like to show you a very small snippet of one of my role models. And so she is really like, for me, somebody I look up. And when you see this video, you're probably also going to understand why. In 1917, I had a spinal tumor. 1989, I had a ovarian cancer. In 1995, I had a left breast quadrectomy. 1996, Don Hodgkin lymphoma. In 1998, I had gastric lymphoma. And then in 2003, I had recurrence of gastric lymphoma. In 2013, there was a recurrence of my left breast cancer. And in May uh, 2015, I had a transverse colostomy. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Dr. Chilita Malingam. She's now 92 years old, and I mean, she's just unbelievable. And when I was sitting there, I, I was just like with these eyes, and, and I asked her, like, okay, what's, what's the secret sauce? How, what do you do? How do you do that? And she was, she, she was, she's a Buddhist, and she was just smiling at me and said, look, you have to accept. Like, once you're born, you're going to die. And as long as you don't accept that, you're, you're going to struggle, you're going to stress. And with the stress, you lose the energy and the, the fact that she's a doctor, so she affects your immune system and everything. And with 89, this is when, sh when we met her, she decided to pick up uh, old Chinese uh, water painting. And so she went to a class, we, got, we went there with her, and she was sitting there, like she's already like, cannot hold the pencil anymore, but she was there with her, with her iPad, filming the whole class, so she could watch it again at home. And she was actually really good, so just such an inspiration, this, this woman, to me. So that's where I'm coming from. So I have 
the, let's call it advantage that I can talk about stress from a theoretical level, but also a lot about how it feels. And it's really interesting, this combination. So we're going to go up right and left now with practical and theory. So now in the second part, I want to focus a bit more on, on like, okay, what is actually stress? Like, what is it and why do we experience stress? What happens in the body and in the mind? Well, stress is always either external or internal. Like you perceive an external stimuli or something from your body. You can have a body stress. Let's say cancer is an internal stress or you have something that you are connected with from, from the outside. And then you, you build up a story. So it's a kind of a mind-body reaction. And so I have here the most elaborated model of the human brain and the human body. <laughs> so I like to use a guitar because it amplifies or it exemplifies very well how the system actually works. Because you can imagine this is the brain and here you have the strings, they all go into the body. So if you have some thoughts and you play something, the body starts to vibrate. And on the other side, you can also work with your body and you can do like some, bring some vibrations into your body and then it will affect your thoughts or the strings. When I, when I hit the, the body, they start to swing. And now what's interesting, um, um, okay, this is a left, left guitar from Chris. <laughs> Anyhow, so if you, if you play a song, some kind of, I don't know, something that is strange, that doesn't work, like if you have a certain kind of thought, you will have a certain kind of vibration in your body. So it really matters what kind of thought you are like cultivating in your brain because it goes into your whole system. So be really careful like, or careful is, I don't want to say attention, but be aware of like that your thinking really affects your whole system. Now, in stress, we have different categories. We have distress and oystress, like positive and negative. And we have acute and chronic. Now, to give you some example, like a, a positive acute stress could be jumping off a cliff into the water. Um, and a could, distress could be an exam. Um, a chronic distress could be overload at work, like all the time, and it's really, really stressful. And positive chronic could, for example, be going with the band on tour and having the time of your life. And so there is like different things that elicit different kind of reactions. And what we also have to be aware of is that we are all different. So this could also flip depending on like your preference. Maybe you like exams. I, I like deadlines. I need a race day and then I really perform. And jumping off a cliff maybe is not my thing. So it is really a personal preference, like what you think is positive or negative. Now, how does stress unfold in the mind body guitar complex to ex uh, to show you that i was bringing another little funny video that i think So what happened here? Maybe I can show you this quickly on this white. So what happened in the brain of this little boy? He had a story in his mind that was like, okay, I'm gonna die. This is like, there are sharks, so it's really, really deep. And this story, what did it do? It changed his physiology. So he was releasing cortisol. He was really stressed. He feels it in the body. And so what does that do? He has an experience. So he's experienced his physiology. He's like, oh, this is really bad. I cannot do it. And what does that do? Well, it affects his belief. And that, of course, triggers the story again. So this is kind of a loop. And in so many things, when we are stressed, and I observe that a lot with, that I'm much less stressed with like ordinary things today really because I just know this is not a problem like and if, if you change the story and you put it in relation you can actually 
actively change your physiology. So it's something that I also like to call the reality loop. Like this is how you build reality because reality is always an illusion. <laughs> it's always based on a story. And, and the kind of mindset or mentality that you shape shapes your reality. It's never the other way around. And once you're aware of that, it's, it's like really interesting. You can start playing with it. And it's, um, it's something that for me was very, very helpful. So coming back to the little boy, we have this stress response again. So you have the story, the story elicits like cortisol. That's the physiology. Then you have the experience and, and then the belief. Now, one important systematical uh, division of the, of the brain and the, the physiology of the body you should know is we have like in our central and peripheral uh, nervous system we have like two systems. Maybe you heard of that the parasympathetic and sympathetic. So these are like classical, the classic two systems that are triggered by stress or relaxation. So sympathetic is everything which is about action and flight and fight and parasympathetic is like slowing down and relaxing and re restoring your energy. And as you can see, the two systems, they are not just in the brain, they are wired in all your organs. So it really affects your whole body in, one si in which system you are. It, I don't say it's good to be just in one or the other. If you're lethargic and only in the parasympathetic activity, that's also not good for your body. Like Craig was saying very nicely, if you have a, <coughs> if a, a pond that has no flow in it, it gets, it gets like um, infected and it's not healthy anymore. So the good balance in between is, is very important. Now, when you activate too much the, the, par uh, the sympathetic nervous system and you're like too, like over a long period of time, that's where the dangerous thing comes. It's not when you go running for a while or you're having a talk, that's not the problem. The problem is if you have constantly this system active and then you release too much cortisol. So what does cortisol do? Um, it's not only bad. So let me start here with the good thing. It increases blood sugar. It, it increases your memory and attention. It's like when you're in the forest, you're hunting coconuts. <laughs> you have to be like attentive. It increases your blood pressure, so it gets you ready. So that's very, very good, very important if you want to survive. But then it also decreases your sensitivity to pain. That is if you're hurt and you have to run and it decreases your serotonin, you get in a bad mood like the little boy, and it suppresses your immune system. What also happens, so this is a temporary effect when you have stress. Now what we also have to know, stress can have long-term effects. Um, who of you have heard of the term epigenetics? Okay, so it's already some people know about it. So what happens is in the old times, or let's say five, 10 years ago, we thought, okay, the genetic code that's how the cells are like primed or how, the, how we are transcribing all the proteins. And that's just a fixed code. Um, the code is fixed, but it's actually not fixed which genes we turn on or off. And stress and other lifestyle um, behaviors can affect which genes you are actually activating or not. So you can actually actively take influence on what kind of proteins, what kind of transcriptions you're, you're triggering in your body. And stress can have a very negative effect. If you have too much stress, it can lead that you transcribe transmitters in your brain that you become more depressive, for example. That's like shown by science. Good. Then we're coming to the fun part of the whole presentation today. So we're going to have some practical exercises. And for that, I would like to thank Chris for the props because I have here a wonderful Mexican hat. And what we're going to do now is we're going to play a little improvisation theater. And we're gonna, not going to play this together. I'm going to ask first one person to come up here on stage. I will use the guitar, so that's fine. And the others who are not elected, they can prompt like things that the person can or has to play. It's kind of a role play. We also have like a mustache if somebody wants to put that on. <laughs> so there's like no limitations to your fantasy. Um, <laughs> no worries, no worries. It, it will not be painful, so it's all fine. But what I learned when I do this exercise is that 
when I ask for a volunteer, it's sometimes hard to find somebody. <laughs> so what I do now, it, or if I ask always the same people come, is I gonna select somebody blindly and then I would like to ask to come this person to come up here and the others can already start thinking about like what the person should think. So let me put myself in the middle and I'm gonna see. Maybe I should turn a little bit so I don't know where who where is. And I think I'm gonna select nobody. <laughs> so Please close your eyes, just for one moment, and sit, sit relaxed. Put your, put your hands on the, on, the, um, on the legs. And everybody like in a comfortable position. And take like some good breath through the nose, like deep breath. Doesn't have to be a soma breathing, but just fill your lungs really, really deeply with, uh, with the air. And then try to soften your eyes. Like try to focus on your eyelids. Like that they're really getting like soft. And the deep breaths again. And then try to soften your cheeks. That they're like nicely hanging. Soften the whole face, your shoulders. Just like relax the whole body. Don't have to do anything, just fill your lungs with air. Three, four deep breaths more. Soften eyes. I'm thinking everybody in his own time, you can open your eyes again slowly, come back to the room. Now, let me ask you, do you observe a difference from your bodily state now to when I was trying to select somebody to play the <laughs> crazy Mexican? <laughs> And we, we're not even a minute in breathing, you know? Like, it's something which I'm going again, like, you can know so much about stress. I can continue with slides and slides and showing you this brain and this. And then I say, okay, who comes and plays the Mexican? It makes boom. I mean, it's even more fun when you have like 500 people. <laughs> 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 then it's like really, there is a famous TED talk where somebody shows like physiology measurements and then the volunteer gets connected and you see the live like screen and then the scientist asks her, can you sing? <laughs> There's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> just goes through the roof. So it's automatic. And that's a very important taking home message. Like, um, the stress response is automatic and so you have to find a habit or first of all do, do observe that you have it but then just the habit how to slow it down and you cannot sink your way to become more resilient you have to you have to breathe you have here a specialist for breath work like this kind of stuff ice water meditation whatever takes your mind off the stress it's really something practical so there is a lot of research you probably know i just have like two examples of like deep breathing it reduces oxidative stress in the blood or in the body and also reduces cortisol so it's one of the cheapest easiest ways you can do before you answer this email before you go in a discussion like if you have a fight at home go out of the house, walk for 10 minutes, come back and pick up the conversation, it, it will be magic. Like, it's really an easy, cheap way to do. Now, there is also science behind it. And actually, some years ago, the, the scientists, they found a place in the subcortical area, which is below the cortex, the old area. So in this part here, which is called locus coeruleus, this is um, a part that releases epinephrine into the cortex. Epinephrine is, is also a hormone that, or noradrenaline, I mean, um, that, that uh, is involved in the stress response. And now the interesting thing about this subcortical area is that this locus coeruleus is CO2 sensitive. So if you have too much like 
like or too little oxygen, it starts to release noradrenaline. And if you bring in O2, you reduce the CO2 level and it relaxes the epinephrine like response. And it goes pretty quickly. I mean, we were doing now very quick breathing and you see it already relaxes you. So that's the first thing you can do. What you also can do to cope with stress, now c comes a lot of practical stuff, is like move. Move your body. Just don't move it too much. If you move it too much, you'll get like too much cortisol, but the good news is it will go down again. I like to move my body a lot, um, and I don't feel stressed after that, so uh, for me it works fine, but just walking or bringing yourself up a bit with the beat, that, with the heartbeat, that helps a lot. Um, and you have here plenty of possibilities to move. I think what's also always important, don't go jogging just because everybody goes running. Like, find what fits for you, like what makes you joy, what brings you pleasure that's like so much more important than just following a trend. Then another really good resource to cope with stress is water. Um, and by water, I mean really water in any kind of form. Like, if you're stressed, just do anything with water, like drink it, walk uh, next to it, go diving, go sailing, swim in it, take a warm shower, take an ice bath. Like, and this is not just like um, a nice idea. There's a lot of science on it. So if somebody's interested, um, I can recommend this book. It's full of references about how water is actually having a healing effect and how it's like um, helping us to relax. And he has very interesting examples like asking across cultures like, please draw an idyllic landscape. It always has water in it. So it seems like they're like genetically and historically primed that water has this kind of calming effect. Or why is it that the front row on a beach front is like five times the price than just like one house block behind? You still can hear the waves and in two minutes you're at the beach, but it has such a meaning for people that they're willing to pay five times more in the front row. Why? Mm -hmm. So there is really something into what... The, yes, please. And do you think that could be why it's so profound when people experience aquifers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you have to ask the participants? <laughs> no, I think it's stupid being a stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> Profound and Tommy go together. <laughs> yes. Well, you're 90% water, so here we go. <laughs> okay. Another thing that is sometimes not so easy to find in the time of today is like find stillness. It's very, very hard. Like everybody says, yeah, just meditate, and being still is so easy. I think it's it's just half of the story. It's super hard. It's an uphill to go there, and it's not easy, and um, it needs a lot of practice and, and, and um, grit to keep it going. But as I'm a practical guy, I also wanted to bring you some practical tools because there uh, are a lot of studies about stillness and what it actually does to our brain. So our brain, or especially our cells, they communicate the information with electrical signals. It's like a chemical electrical transmission. It's like a huge radio station that sends in like thousand different channels. And so what you can do, you can place electrodes on the skull and you can measure electrical waves. And we have different brain waves. Like when we are, when we are sleeping, like then we have more delta and nearly unconscious. And when we are awake, we have alpha, beta and gamma and, and it's another brain state. And, and which waves we have and in which like combination and which, which fluctuation we can say in which state we actually are. And so what scientists did is they made some research with monks. Just I can also, I will share all the slides with uh, the group so you we can see all the references. And they were testing, like, if somebody's meditating for a long time, what happens? And it actually shows they have more attention skills. They synchronize the extrinsic and default network, which is kind of a, a default activity pattern in the brain. And it, it also seems that it influences the immune system. I would take that with a grain, uh, but it's, um, 
it's, it's interesting to see. Probably if you had tried meditation yourself, you observed it has a positive effect. So now, taking a neuroscientific approach on meditation, I was bringing with me here a brain-computer interface. So what this is, you have here three electrodes, and you can place that on the front of your skull like this and it will measure my brain activity. Not only because when I smile, as you know, the muscles also are like triggered by electronic signals. So when I do like this, the electronic signals action potential from the, from the skin will travel and will put a lot of noise into the system. So if somebody wants to try, um, there is an app here somebody where you can like use your power of your brain to bring actually a fruit to float. And if you want, I think we have quickly time to take a look at that. If somebody wants yes. to try. Yeah, I would love to hear what you yes. do. Sure. So the first thing is we try to connect. And then if you maybe close your eyes and just try to think about maybe something very specific or meditate or, or think of a candle and just look at the candle that works sometimes. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> we had Tony in the other week and he was actually really good because he took over uh, when it was the hardest level and, and he managed to, to raise it. So yes, close. Or I, I leave it here and we can try it after the session, otherwise we will get late. But is there like another app which might be more detailed? That yes, that this is just like one that is easy, plug and play, and, and you can actually pretty quickly have an effect. But they are more expensive and... More detailed. Like yes. If you could share that with the group, I'd be really interested. Yes, in I can do that. Definitely. Um, so I think it's a fun thing because... Uh, Sometimes meditation can be very abstract, especially at the beginning. Now, um, some of you were in my middle class already, you know, with, where I was talking about how fast the brain um, forgets again. Like you learn something new, you go 10 days in a retreat and then you come home. And, and so I really like this, um, this comic. Like he says, the only thing I've learned from my mistakes is that apparently I'll keep making them. <laughs> And this is just the truth. It's not like a, a stupid joke. This is like how we work and, and we should like not be too harsh on ourselves if this happens because this is the wiring of us. And so what can you do? So I have two more like add-ons for like how you can try to build up new habits of, of like coping with difficult situations or stress. And, and the first one um, is a role model. Like find somebody that is in a very similar situation that you are and then maybe is a bit ahead of your journey. It's important that the person is not too far away. Like sometimes cancer patients come to me and say, Martin, look, your story is just too much. Like I felt so bad when I, I saw that because I think I can never run a marathon or a triathlon. And, and then I always say it's not about the marathon. It's like find your marathon, whatever that is. So find a role model that is just enough ahead, but not like too far, because then it's too intimidating. And the other thing is find a community. And this is also one reason why I was starting this WhatsApp group. I made a lot of good experiences with my camps with the aftercare of like using the group to share your, not only your successes, but also your mistakes and like supporting each other and, and cheering for each other, because this is really something that can help you for like when you come home, that's the hard part. Here is nice, the juices are made, the yoga is ready. And so that's easy. I mean, it's not, not easy, but at home that's gonna be hard and, and use the group to, to support each other to do that. And the last is about habits. So I could do a full talk on habits, but just to have like four taking home messages, which you also see in other classes. If you want to build a new habit, the first step that always helps is like make it super small, like make it as small as possible. Um, a classic is, for example, do one push up per day. Okay. 
You will not do just one push-up. You will probably end up doing three or five or ten. But if you say, I do at least one. And now, when you're going to do this push-up, well, find a hook. Find something, a trigger, that when you see that or when you, when you do that, then you're going to do also the new habit. So for example, brushing your teeth. Everybody here was probably brushing the teeth today, maybe even twice. So you can say, every time I do that, I, I surf on this habit I already have, I make one push-up, okay? And now comes the fun part, don't sink. <laughs> like, if you start sinking, you start arguing with yourself, and then you're lost. So there is actually um, a rule, you can, you can look that up on, on Google, which is called the five second rule by Mel Robbins. So what she is saying is, if you, if you want to do something that you're a bit like, uh, what you have to do is you have to speak out loud from five backwards. So you have to count. You have to say five, four, three, two, one, go. And when you're at one, there is no discussion. You just do it. Like if you have to make a phone call and you're a bit like, oh, I should call, huh? then just start five, four, and so what happens when you do that is that your frontal lobe, which is normally involved in reasoning and argumenting, is so busy counting backwards because you should not count up like upwards, backwards, because that's unnatural. So <laughs> your frontal lobe is so busy with counting, okay, after five is four, uh, so you cannot argue with yourself. And when you're at one, you have to do it. It's actually really funny, and I, I use it sometimes. So that's like, don't start thinking because <laughs> Don't think, oh, should I go running or not? No, just <laughs> go. And then the last one, I think most of you already, already heard it in the last talk, like give yourself reward when you do a little step. Like, like do the hand, place it like this, and give yourself the, the, the hit on the back. Or find your own pose, like the brain needs dopamine, otherwise, it will not realize that it was like doing something good. So that was just a little crash course on like how you can build habits. Maybe you can play around with it in this week that you're here and in the classes and see like if, if it sticks or not. I'm really curious to know. And yes, thank you very much for being here tonight and listening to us. Thank you.